Hey, everybody. How are you? Are you glad to be in church? I am, too, and I'm glad to be in this incredible church. You know, I always like to know a little bit about who I'm speaking to, so indulge me here for a second. We're going to be talking about relationships, marriage, and friendship, and other things, but anybody in here happen to be engaged to be married? Stand up if you're engaged to be married. I see some hands going up. Stand up if you're engaged, all over the place. And at the other campuses, too. All right, that's awesome, congratulations. I want you to do this on the other campuses as well. How about uh, couples that you're not quite engaged, but you're on the edge of commitment? <laughs> Nobody brave enough to stand up, I didn't think so. Maybe at some of the other campuses, though. How about um, anybody that, uh, single, hoping to have a date sometime in the next year? <laughs> a lot of you. <laughs> Relax, you can sit down, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, how about um, couples that are newlyweds like you've been married less than a year, 12 months or less? Stand up if you're newlyweds, would you? Here and at the other campuses. Look at that, a lot of you. That's congrat. Has anybody been married less than a month? You have? How's it going? <laughs> That's great. How about uh, any couples here been married more than a year? Stand up. It's not a trick question. There we go. And at the other campuses, <laughs> I love how the singles are clapping. Wow, more than a year. Keep standing. Keep standing. All right, married more than 10 years. Keep standing. Some of you are doing the math. I can tell right now. You sat down and sat right back. stood right back up. How about uh, more than 20 years? More than 30 years? By the way, I'm talking about being married to the same person consecutively. <laughs> How about 40 years of marriage or more? All right. You're looking at me like, just keep going, kid. All right, this is a big one. 50 years of marriage or more. All right. How about 53? 53 years of marriage or more. We lost you guys. Two couples left and at other campuses. I know you're standing at other campuses too. How about, so how long have you guys been married? 53? And how about you guys? 59? <laughs> Well, we got a new Buick for you right out here. <laughs> That's incredible, 59 years of marriage. Now, I don't have a car for you, but I got a book, and I think it's gonna change everything for you guys. <laughs> it's called Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, and I think you're gonna get a lot out of it. So you come see me at the book uh, table back there where I'm sending books after the service, I'll give it to you. So that's incredible, 50, give them another hand. That's, that's fantastic. Way to go. And you guys too, yeah. Um, so uh, 33 years for Leslie and me, and uh, by the way, we have the same name. This is crazy, but it's true. I'm Leslie and she's Leslie. It's confusing, but that's the way God planned it for us. To make it even more complex, I'm the third. That means my dad's name is Leslie. My grandfather's name is Leslie. I'm Leslie. I'm married to Leslie. So when we had our first son, we named him John. John Leslie. <laughs> So uh, I feel a little bit like half a person without my Leslie with me here tonight, but she's up uh, with our two little guys in Seattle. Every spring, uh, Leslie and I put on this little event we refer to as Symbus, S-Y-M-B-I-S, saving your marriage before it starts. We've been doing this for a long time, and uh, we'll have hundreds of engaged couples come in uh, and for this weekend, and we do what we can to help them launch lifelong love. As a result of doing that year in, year out, we get invited to a lot of weddings. In fact, rarely does a week go by that we don't get invited to a wedding someplace. Now, 
If you go to enough weddings, you know that people's personalities come through in these ceremonies. Every, every ceremony is a little bit different. So we have quite a few wedding stories. My favorite happened years ago, and it had to do with this little kid that was maybe four years old. He was a little ring bearer. And they had him, you know, dressed in a little tuxedo, white shorts with the little bow tie and the knee socks. And you know how they teach the little ones to do that wedding walk? And he's doing the wedding walk, and as he's coming down, every few steps, he would turn and he would look to the congregation and he would go, Rawr. <laughs> Rawr. And he was growling at people on the way down, and people were laughing. What's he doing that for? It's cute, but why? And, and he came down and he stood at the uh, altar like a perfect little gentleman. He kind of forgot about it because he was so well behaved until we had the recessional. And then he growled at people on the way out. And word started to spread. He stole the show at the reception afterwards. Everybody was abuzz talking about how sweet this was, but why was he doing it? Well, this little guy had the impression that he was supposed to be the ring bear. <laughs> right? What's a ring bearer anyway, right? <laughs> if you're three or four years old. And, and by the way, I know some of you are thinking, I made that story up. That's happened at two weddings that I've been to. One I was in, and the little guy had a meltdown at the tuxedo shop because he thought he was getting a bear costume. So, <laughs> um, but Leslie and I, we left that first experience, and we said, that's a perfect illustration of how our beliefs impact our behavior, right? Whether our beliefs are right or wrong, they're still the fuel for what we do, particularly in our relationships. And that's why I want to look at some of, maybe some of our little crooked thinking about, uh, you know, surrounding relationships. We can get kind of messed up on this a little bit, and that's why I love this series. I think it's so fantastic that you've been going through this, and I've watched it online. Oh, incredible. I've learned a ton. And uh, what an honor to get to talk with you tonight. In fact, let's do this just to make sure everybody has the right attitude as we think about spending the next few minutes talking about relationships. Why don't you just turn to the person next to you and say these words, you really need this. You feel better, don't you? <laughs> Every there. We all need this. Relationships, right? It's the hub of the wheel. Some years ago, Leslie and I, at Seattle Pacific University, where we teach, uh, we thought, uh, why don't we offer a course in relationships? You ever thought about this? We offer students courses in anything you can almost imagine, but not a single course in relationships. And, you know, it doesn't matter what your major is. It can be accounting or nursing or anything else. Uh, the hub of the wheel in life is our relationships. It's the number one source of joy and happiness as well as consternation, relationships. And so why don't we have courses in how to have healthy relationships? Well, we thought, let's do this. We'll call it Relationships 101. Now, if you know anything about academic settings, you know you don't just dream up classes and start teaching them. You gotta get them approved by the provost and the dean and all that stuff. So we put a little proposal together. The top of it said Relationships 101, and we listed out the lectures that we wanted to give. We want to give a lecture on uh, uh, how to fall in love without losing your mind, okay? Uh, how do you improve your love IQ? How do you make smart decisions in the midst of this, you know, kind of brain chemistry stuff going on, you know? And, and then we thought we should also lecture on breaking up. A lot of dating couples do this. How do you break up and stay in one piece? And we want to talk about what's the difference between the, the heartbreaker and the brokenhearted, and how do you approach that? And there's some interesting research on that. We want to give that to our students. And we thought we should also lecture on friendship. Can you imagine life without your friends? Yet there's a difference between what we call friends of the heart and friends of the road. You know, there's certain friends that we have. It doesn't matter how far apart we move. We pick up right where we left off. We stay in touch through uh, social media, all the rest. And then there's friends that we go, I wonder what ever happened to her? What ever happened to him? And you just kind of lose, that's a friend of the road, right? And we want to talk about how do you have more friends of the heart? And we thought, you know, just like dating, we should probably talk about what do you do when your friends fail you? Now, if that hasn't happened yet, put your seatbelt on, because it's coming. It's just a part of life. One of my philosophies of living is that we all have our own private Gethsemane, and we all have our own Judas, and we wake up some morning, we go, how could he have done that? I trusted him with my money. 
I trusted her with my secrets. How could they have done this to me? What do you do when your friends fail? So it was all these different realms of relationship, you know, bridging the gender gap, relating to God without feeling phony, all these different realms. We wanted to put this in a course, and so we gave it to the committee. They studied it for a little while and finally looked up at us and said, "Mm, thanks, but no thanks. We said, why not? They said, well, it doesn't have enough academic rigor. I said, what do you mean by that? They said, well, it just doesn't have, you know, the depth, the rigor that it needs as an academic course. I said, no, 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 we can, we can change that. We can put some information in there that confuses the students, if you like, you know? And <laughs> they said, well, there's not even a textbook for a class like this. I said, well, well, we'll write our own. They said, well, other universities don't have classes like this. I said, well, maybe they should. Maybe they will. They said, well, it's not going to work here. And, and that was that. So we left and feeling a little dejected, but we thought, uh, let's not give up on this. And we retooled that proposal a little bit, came back a few months later. Again, thanks, but no thanks. We went through this three times that academic year. Finally, on the third round, I think we just kind of wore them down. And they said, okay, we're going to let you teach this, this course, but only under these conditions. And they started to list them off. Number one, the class will need to be pass-fail, so it doesn't impact anybody's grade point average. Number two, it needs to be a general elective. Um, You know, it's not a required course for anything. Uh, Number three, it'll need to be a class that's taught as an overload. That means in addition to your full-time teaching responsibilities. Fourthly, they said you'll need to teach it on your own time schedule, meaning once, you know, all the other classes have found a a classroom and a time on the calendar and space, you know, uh, if you can find anything else left over, you can teach it then. And, uh, oh yeah, and then uh, number five, they said you need to teach it without compensation. So with that pat on the back, (laughs) we set off to teach this class, Relationships 101. We put the description, the course catalog, you know, the description in there and just waited to see if any students might sign up for this class. And and we had a a little classroom, it had 12 chairs in it, uh, and we found it was open at six o'clock on Monday evenings. And we had the classroom for two and a half hours on Monday evenings. And, um, and so we just said, man, if we can even just get half the chairs filled, at least we'll be on our way. And so we waited, see if anybody would sign up for this class. About 10 a.m. Uh, on the first day of registration, when the registrar called my office and he said, hey, doc, he said, uh, uh, we got a problem. I said, what is it? You need my classroom space or, or, or what is it? And he said, no, no, no. He said, uh, we just realized you didn't cap the course. I said, what are you talking about? He said, in the computer, you filled out all the information on the class, but you, uh, you didn't limit the number of students that could take the class. I said, what does that have to do with anything? He said, well, we've only been open for registration for a couple of hours and 350 students have signed up for your class. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I said, keep talking. And uh, he said, well, by default, the computer system just moved you into the auditorium and moved the class that was supposed to meet in there into that little classroom that you had. (laughs) And I said, God bless you. And and, uh, doesn't that speak volumes about the hunger, the thirst we have for information on healthy relationships? That was over 15 years ago, almost 20 years ago that that took place. We've been teaching that class on Monday nights at 6 p.m., not prime time for an undergraduate class. I've been teaching it at that time ever since. It's the most popular class on the campus. It's always got a waiting list to get in. We love teaching these students. And on the very first night of this class, we tell these students, it doesn't matter to us whether you take a single note the entire semester. It's up to you. It's a pass-fail course. There's no pop quiz. There's no midterm. There's no final. You'll get out of this experience whatever you'd like to get out of it. Except tonight, on the very first night, we want you to write down at least one single sentence. And we tell them, the sentence that we're about to give you, it has the potential to revolutionize every relationship you ever attempt to build. Whether it's on the home front with mom and dad or with your siblings or with your roommate or your teammates, your potential soulmate and all the rest. If you can allow the truth of this sentence to kind of seep down into the cortex of your brain and be lived out through your spirit, it has that kind of transformative experience and, and uh, they all get poised with their pencils and they're ready to take down the sentence. I wanna give it to you tonight because you might find it helpful. Here it is. If you try to build intimacy 
with another person before you've done the difficult work of getting whole on your own, all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself. And we'll leave it on the screen there so you can write that down. If you try to build intimacy, if you try to build a connection, if you try to build a relationship, if you try to get close to another person, before you've done the difficult work of getting healthy, getting whole on your own, all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself and they'll fall flat. Guaranteed. Why? Because nobody was designed to complete you. Sorry to break it to you, but it's the truth. I mean, I know that's a tough pill to swallow for some of us because, I don't know, I thought I was going to get to this person. I kind of lean into them. They'd lean into me. They'd make up for the things I'm lacking, and, and they'd complete me. Tough pill to swallow because we grow up reading the, you know, the fairy tales, and, and we, we watch the movies and, and read the book. In fact, the, probably the most iconic movie ever even has the sentence in there. Remember Jerry Maguire? Remember that movie? Remember one of the most quoted movies in all of cinematic history? Remember the story? It, it, Tom Cruise's character has fallen in love with Renee Zellweger's character, and they've gotten married. And they're having a really tough go of it in the first year of marriage. Something Leslie and I can identify with because we had a tough go of it in our first year. In fact, the very first line of that book, Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, says we never had pre-marriage counseling, but we spent the first year of our marriage in therapy. And that's the truth. And so we can identify. And he's having, he's struggling. He's on the road. He's having this road trip with success with his business, but he's got to repair things on the home front. And so he comes home early and walks up the little steps up into his bungalow where they're living. He's got his luggage, he's got his overcoat on. He walks in and he realizes he's walked into the middle of this support group with all these women sitting around. And they're all commiserating about how miserable men can be. And he's walked right into the midst of it. You remember the scene? He puts his luggage down, he says, I'm looking for my wife. And then he sees her there, she kind of leans, you know, from behind the lampshade there and Caesar, and he begins this speech. He launches into this amazing speech that surely took three writers a month and a half to craft, you know? And, um, and, and, and he gets to this speech, and, and, and it's just like, he says those words, you complete, now, now people that went to this movie, a lot of people were quoting that line, show me the money, but every romantic was quoting this other line, what was it? You complete me. You hear all those women? You complete me, right? <laughs> you complete me, right? You had me at hello, right? Remember this scene? And, and uh, he gets to the climax of this speech, and he says that sentence, and he says it with such pathos. He says it with such deep emotion. In fact, any guy in here think they can say it exactly like Tom Cruise said it? Anybody want to stand up where they're seated and take a stab at it right now for us? I didn't think I was going to get a taker on that, so I'm going to do my best job here, and I'm going to say it right into the camera. He, 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 he's, he's in the midst of this speech. He gets to this sentence. All these women, their jaws have dropped down to the floor. They can't believe the words coming out of his mouth. And, and he looks at her, and he looks at like she's the only woman in the room. And he looks at her, and he says, You. <laughs> Complete me. <laughs> That's exactly how he says it. <laughs> and I look like him too, I know. <laughs> and every romantic that's watching that movie at that point does what? Oh, 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 I wish somebody would say that to me. Oh, I'd love to say that to somebody else. I got to tell you, I'm no psychologist or anything, but if, well, actually I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you believe that, that this person can complete you, you're setting yourself up for serious heartache because nobody was designed to do that. You heard a fantastic message last week about how when you get this relationship right, these relationships get better, right? Get easier, get healthier. And it's so true because nobody can complete you. Ultimately, just want to remind you today, ultimately your compulsion for completion is met in a relationship with your Heavenly Father. Do you guys know the name uh, uh, Neil Clark Warren? You ever heard that name before? 
You might have heard that name, but if you haven't, um, you may have heard of his company. It's called eHarmony. You ever heard of eHarmony? If you haven't heard of eHarmony, you've got to watch more television. Uh, <laughs> Neil's a wonderful friend. He's been on this platform before, I think about a year ago to talk here. And uh, years and years ago, before eHarmony was ever even a thought in his head, I remember having dinner in Pasadena and uh, we were there, late night dinner, and Neil and Marilyn were there, Leslie and I were there, and, and uh, uh, we just love those guys. And I, I remember I asked Neil once, I said, hey, if you could only give one word of advice to a couple about to be married, what would it be? Well, man, he didn't have to think more than a split second. I mean, he had it right there on the tip of his tongue. He said, get yourself healthy before you get yourself married. And that's really what we're talking about here, right? Getting healthy. Why? Because your relationships, whether it's marriage or anything else, your relationships can only be as healthy as you are. Therefore, one of the most important things you ever do for your relationships is work on you. I remember that conversation that night with Neil and Marilyn and Leslie around the table. We got energized by that and how do you get healthy and it turned into some research and we did some writing together and, and uh, you know, looking at how do you, and in fact, we had this mountain of research on how to get healthy spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, relationally and, and uh, we were thinking, how do you put the cookies on the bottom shelf and, and we began to realize as we wrapped our heads around this that it really comes down to three things. If you want to get healthy, you got to get a grip, you got to get a, a lock on these three things and we began to write them out after all this year, it went on for like a year and a half of all this research and we began to spell them out. And then one day, uh, and, and we would published this and some of it's in that book, Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts and some things. And, and, and one day I was on the airplane and I was reading my Bible and I turned to this passage in Ephesians and I went, and this so often happens in my life as a social scientist. We do some experiment, some study, some research and then lo and behold, oh, there's that stuff I thought we discovered right there, right? <laughs> Somehow the Apostle Paul got a hand on this, this thing before we did, you know? And, and it's the same thing in the same order that we talk. I'm going to share that with you tonight because it's so valuable. How do you, if you're like me, you go, well, how, how do you get healthy, right? How do you do this? How do you know if you're this? First of all, has anybody kind of checked that off their list? Well, woke up the other day, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Completely healthy, right? Emotionally, psychologically, relationally, not working on that anymore, right? We never finish. It's always a process of becoming, right? Um, and, and, and so let me, let me just give you these things that we found. We, we said, the, first of all, if you want to get healthy, you've got to get a lock on what we call your profound significance. It's right there in the notes. You can write it right down. Profound significance. You've got to understand that God loves you so incredibly, so profoundly. You are so significant in his eyes. He loves you as if you're the only person on the planet, as St. Augustine said. Now, it's one thing to kind of hear that and sing about it, Jesus loves me and all the rest, and if you've been going to church very long, you, you've kind of heard that message, right? But it's quite another thing to hear that Maybe you've memorized some scripture, Romans 8, there's therefore now no condemnation for those that are with Jesus. And you can hear that and, 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 and kind of think it through and all that, but it's quite another thing to experience it deep down in your bones. To experience God's grace, not just at the head cerebral level, but deep down in your spirit, you know? Have you had that experience with God? that he loves you that much, you know, I, I think that so much hinges on that to get healthy. It's one of those things, and, and, and if you're like me, you go, well, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I have. Well, let me do this. Let me challenge you to tune into the single most important conversation you'll ever have. You had it last night, and you had it this morning before you came in here, and you're gonna have it tomorrow and in fact, you're gonna have it tonight when you fall asleep because this conversation never turns off. It's 24-7. It's your internal dialogue. 
In fact, what if before you fell asleep tonight, you could take a little computer chip out of the back of your head, slip it into your laptop, and it would tabulate your conversation, your internal conversation, for the last 24 hours. And it would categorize it as either positive self-talk or negative self-talk. Which one of those buckets would be most full for you at the end of any given day? Might surprise you to know, if you're like most people, on average, you'd discover that 73% of your self-talk would fall into that negative bucket. We know that from research at UCLA. But not the person who has a lock on their profound significance. Not the person that has that experience of, of, of feeling God's grace in their life. Do you kind of need to budge open that window that's been painted shut in your life for too long to allow God's grace to kind of breeze into your relationships a little bit more? You know, profound significance. Look at this, this passage that Paul has in Ephesians chapter three, uh, beginning in verse 17. I'm reading this from the message. I love how this is, is here. He says, I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love, that you'll be able to take in with all followers of Jesus the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. <laughs> I love that, the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. And then he says, reach out and experience the breadth, test the length, plumb the depths, rise to the heights. And then listen to this sentence, he says, live full lives, full in the fullness of God, it's as if he's, make sure you don't miss the point here. This is about living a fulfilled life. Live full lives, full in the fullness of God. We're talking about our compulsion for completion. It's not met in another relationship, right? Sometimes on college campuses where I speak, and certainly my own in Seattle, I'll see students that are, are kind of walking around, you know, they're dating and they're, they're walking around kind of leaning in on each other. Not just figuratively, but literally. Like they're just walking around like this, right? You ever seen a couple like that? Just walking around, and Leslie and I call them A-frame relationships, okay? <laughs> what happens in an A-frame relationship when one person stumbles, right? The whole relationship gives way. Why? Because there's no individuation. There's no individual identity. It becomes an enmeshed relationship here, right? That's what we're getting at when we talk about this idea of profound significance. Sure. Other people can help us as iron sharpens iron. We can help each other on this pathway to wholeness. But ultimately, that's the work that we have to do on our own with the Holy Spirit in our lives, you know? Profound significance. Once you get a lock on that, let me have you turn your attention to the second thing that we found in our research. And that is not just profound significance, because that has to do with your relationship with your Heavenly Father, but unswerving authenticity unswerving authenticity. The first one is about relating to God. The second one is about relating to you, relating to yourself. I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody walk into my counseling office struggling with that proverbial disease to please. Some of you know exactly what I mean. And they walk around and they go, oh boy, if I could just accomplish this goal over here, I bet people would like me. Oh man, if I could get into that club, that'd be cool. Oh man, if I did this thing, mom and dad would finally give me the blessing, you know? And oh, if I did this over here, I bet so-and-so would smile in my direction and, and, and they live their life, you know? The disease to please. But not the person who has a lock on unswerving authenticity. See, what they know is there's a path that God has called them to follow and they're not about to step off it. Because God has called them to walk down that path in spite of what anybody else says, in spite of what anybody else might say behind their back, but in spite of what anybody's attitude is, they know, well, this is it. This is what God has called me to. You know, I gotta tell this story while I'm here at this church because I was thinking of it as I was flying in from Seattle on my way down here. However many years ago, 15 years ago, however long it's been, 18 years ago, I was in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I was at my publisher's, Zondervan Publishing House. And we had an all-day meeting about some projects we were working on. And, and the team, about, uh, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten of us, uh, went out to dinner together. And we're at this Chinese restaurant. And Bruce Reiskamp, the president of the company at the time, was sitting at the head of the table. And we'd placed our orders. 
And I leaned over to, to Bruce and I said, hey, Bruce, what's really exciting about the pub house these days? We've been talking about my projects all day and Leslie here, but uh, what's really exciting for you guys at the publishing house? And it, just this hush fell over the table. And they were like, tell him, tell him. And uh, he reached down from a, some kind of a case that he had down there and he pulled out a book that was called The Purpose Driven Life. I'd never heard of it. Nobody had ever heard of it before, but they were pretty excited about this book. And uh, I said at the time, I said, well, I don't know what uh, is inside those covers, but I just got a message right between the eyes. Right in the title, right? See, that's what we're talking about here, right? Purpose. Why on earth am I here? The person that has a grip on unswerving authenticity knows why they're on this planet. And they're going to do that because that's what God has called them to do. Look at this next passage. It's just a couple of verses after what we just read here in Ephesians chapter four now, verse one. And Paul says this about unswerving authenticity. He says, I want you to get out there and walk. And then he says, better yet, run. Run, run on the road God called you to travel. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that goes nowhere. Unswerving authenticity. Third thing, on the path to wholeness, not just profound significance, that's your relationship with God, not just unswerving authenticity, that's your relationship with yourself, but the final one is self-giving love. Self-giving love. This has to do with your relationship with everybody else. You can see the progress here, right? It starts with God, then with you, and now with everybody. Everybody else, with others. And once you get a grip on this and you begin to transcend your own boundaries and recognize other people's needs that are unique to them, I gotta tell you, friend, you begin to love the life you live. This is when life gets really interesting. How many of you have teenagers at home? How many mom and dads have teenagers at home? Oh, a lot of you. No wonder you're in church. All right. <laughs> mom and dad, what's the, what's the number one goal that every adolescent on the planet has? It's to answer a question. And it's a question they never say out loud. But it's all about identity. Who am I? That's the question. They're obsessed with it. Who am I? Right? And that's what they should be obsessed with. That's the developmental period. If they're not asking that question, there's a problem. And, and so they get very, very self-focused, self-referent. You know? And, and uh, they get into a social situation and, and they're thinking to themselves, how am I doing? What do people think of me? How are my shoes? People wearing these kind of shoes? How about my hair? Is my hair good? What about my pants? Are they low enough? I can't tell. Are they low enough or not? You know? <laughs> it's almost as if they're wearing mirrored sunglasses, but they've taken the lenses out and they flip them around. They put them back in the frames and they look out at the world and what do they see? Yeah, a reflection of their own neediness, right? And you don't have to be 13 to be stuck there. You can be 30. You don't have to be 14. You can be 40, right? Because it takes some work to transition out of that to where you can walk into a social setting and no longer be consumed with the question, how am I doing? But instead the question, how you doing? And really mean it. And really transcend your own boundaries to recognize other people's unique needs and, and put into practice one of the most important relationship skills ever, empathy. That capacity to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see the world as they see it. When was the last time somebody did that for you? When was the last time you did that for somebody else? It's a rarity, I gotta tell you. We sympathize, but empathize, that's a different, sympathy is standing on the shore throwing out a life ring to somebody that's struggling in the water. Everybody in this room would do that because you're decent human beings. Empathy, much more risky, that's, that's diving into the water. Risking your own well-being to bring that person back to safety. Not everybody does that. In fact, that's so rare, what do we call that? What do we call those people? Heroes, right? And it's just as heroic when we do that in our relationships, whether it's in friendships or relationships at work or, or relationships on the home front. Empathy. Man, I wish we could box it up. I wish before you left, you could, you could go out in the foyer and say, uh, oh, I'm supposed to pick up a box out here. It has my name on it, and uh, it's a box of empathy. I like to take that home and let it run wild throughout my house tonight. You know? It'd change everything, wouldn't it? Empathy. Self-giving love, it's a big part of it. If you're wondering to yourself, how do I know if I have a lock on self-giving love, I suggest you look to 
the greatest sermon ever preached, the greatest relationship lesson ever taught, the greatest lecture ever given. We call it the Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus gave it to, oh man, he said some radical things in that, that message. Some radical thing. In fact, this one was driven home for me in, of all places, Rome, Italy. I had a bunch of airline miles that were going to expire. I'll never forget this. I came into the kitchen. I said to Leslie, I said, we, we got to use these miles or they're going to go to waste. She said, that's the last thing I want to do right now is get on an airplane with the kids. She said, go someplace with your dad. I said, hey, that's a good idea. I called dad. He's in Phoenix. And, and I said, dad, I said, I got this idea. Yeah, what is it, son? I said, uh, I got this idea that you and I take a trip to, to Rome, Italy. I said, I've never been. I know you've been before. You can kind of show me around. And, and he goes, well, that sounds fun. I said, well, here's the deal, Dad. If you want to do this, I said, I will pick up the airfare if you want to pay for everything else. And uh, <laughs> it worked out pretty well for me. And uh, <laughs> we had a great trip. We really did. And, and one night, we're having dinner in, in the hotel. And, and I, I remember learning about this in seminary. But Dad reminded me of it. And uh, in the days of the Roman Empire, Every little kid was required by Roman law to kind of ease the burden of a Roman soldier as they're passing through their village. And so the little kid would have to kind of carry his backpack, the soldier's backpack, for one Roman mile in either direction from his home and then put it on, you know, uh, put it after that mile, put it on the ground and go there. You know, I've, I've done what I'm supposed to do. And because this was such a common practice, kids started to put um, little stakes in the ground carve their initials into them. And so they'd know exactly how far they'd have to carry that, that uh, satchel or what have you. And, and it was such a common practice in all these villages throughout the Roman Empire that Jesus used it as a sermon illustration. When he said, hey, you want to do something radical in your home? You want to do something radical in your marriage? You want to do something radical as a parent? You want to do something radical as a coworker? He said, don't just walk the first mile. Everybody's looking for that. Everybody expects that because you're a good person. You do that to clear your conscience. Walk another mile, they don't see, they don't see coming. See what happens. Radical, right? When was the last time somebody did that for you? When was the last time you did that for somebody else? And I know some of you are thinking, oh man, I don't know, you know. Walking the extra mile, that's, that's a big deal. That's, I gotta Google that, you know. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta save my money for that. That's... That's like extracting, hey, let me tell you something. You're gonna have the opportunity to walk the extra mile for somebody before this day is done. Because we walk the extra mile in big, extravagant ways, and we do it in, in less, less extravagant ways, in little ways. Tuesday mornings, I take the trash out. Signed up that, for that a long time ago. I'm Anybody do that? How many of you take the trash out in your marriage? All right. I, I signed up for that a long, long time ago, more than 30 years ago, been taking out the trash on most Tuesdays, you know? Um, well, I walk the first mile every time I take out the trash. That's the first mile. I walk the extra mile when I take out the trash and I don't say anything about it. <laughs> you follow me? We have all kinds of opportunities to walk the extra mile for each other. Look at this passage. Look at this next verse. Paul says this. Pour yourselves out for each other in acts of love, alert at noticing differences, and quick at mending fences. <laughs> Pour yourselves out for each other in acts of love, self-giving love. You get a lock on that, man, you're going to love the life you live. You will. If you try to build intimacy, you try to build a connection with another person, you try to get close to another person, before you've done the difficult work of getting whole, getting healthy on your own. All your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself and they'll fall flat. Do you guys always listen this well? Man, you guys know when to laugh, you know when to listen. I'd like to speak here more often, this is fun. I like you guys. This is, uh, I, I gotta tell you, um, as we wrap, I wanna have a word of prayer with you in a minute, but let me tell you something. I got, I got two books out there in a little book bundle, and it, they're, they're half price, and uh, more or less. And uh, one of them I mentioned is uh, Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. The other is uh, The Good Fight. And, um, 
How many in here have ever had a conflict with somebody that you care about? <laughs> Keep your hands up. Look around the room. You see the people that don't have their hands up? What do we call them? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and they're in church. <laughs> so the little message in, in uh, the good fight is, is uh, wrapped up in this idea that conflict can become the price tag for deeper intimacy. If you know how to fight a good fight, you can actually use conflict to bring the two of you closer together. Conflict's inevitable. It's just a part of life. But if you know how to turn that around, you can actually create more intimacy, draw more close to each other uh, through it. So anyway, that's what that little bundle, and by the way, you can feel good. Like I said, this is basically sold at, at half price out there as a bundle. If there is any profit to be made on this, I want you to feel good about it because it goes to, to needy children and um, uh, both of them live with me in Seattle. And so, uh, uh, <laughs> and one's going to college soon, so he's very needy. So, you guys, what an honor to get to be here with you in this great church. You guys, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, let me pray for you. You guys uh, go to the, one of the greatest churches in the world. Father, we just thank you for a special place like this and for a special time to get together with people that uh, want to be better, with people that uh, want the best relationships possible. And, and that's why we pray that you would uh, oh, just teach us how to receive your love, help us to open our arms to your grace, not just to, to talk about it, but to experience it. Help us to understand the path that you've called us to walk on so we know why on earth we're here. Help us to uh, take the love that you give us and, and give it to people around us. I just thank you so much for this, this privilege to live this life that you've given us. We love you and it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Jay Cranda, the online pastor here at Saddleback Church. We're so glad you joined us to watch this message today. At Saddleback, we believe that life is better together. That's why we want you to get connected to our church family, whether in person or online. We have campuses all over Southern California and on four continents all around the world that would love to welcome you to their weekend services. You can find a campus near you at saddleback.com locations. And if you're not able to attend a campus in person, don't worry. We have an online community designed just for you. You'll have an opportunity to connect with the messages each week and find resources to help you grow your faith. Thanks again for watching, and we look forward to welcoming you into our church family.